call this meeting to order. It is 7 p.m. on Monday, November 13th. This is a regular meeting of the Richfield School Board. Um, in attendance this evening, we have board members Tim Paulus, Crystal Brocky, John Ashmead, Peter Tensing, Paula Cole. I'm Christine Malik, and we also have Superintendent Unowski. I would like to remind um, all of us of the Richfield Public Schools mission statement. Richfield Public Schools inspires and empowers each individual to learn, grow, and excel. We'll keep this in the forefront of our minds as we work together this evening. Um, we will start with review and approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Paulus, a second by Mr. Ashmead. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye and the agenda is approved. Um, we had no requests for public comment this evening, so we will move on to information and proposals and non-action items and receiving of delegations. So we have Centennial Elementary School here today. So I'm excited to welcome Centennial Elementary, um, coming with staff and uh, parent and students, uh, talking about <laughs> picturing writing and something they've been working on uh, for quite a while. Do we need a microphone or we go? I Please. should grab the microphone, yeah. right. just so you are on the video. Thanks for having us here tonight. We're very excited to come and talk about picturing and writing at Centennial. This is our second year of the program, and I brought along with me two ESL teachers. This is Camila Carroll and Spencer Neitzel. Spencer is our lead ESL teacher for us and kind of has overseen the process of um, improving our picturing writing program at Centennial. And um, our friend Camila is learning about the program and she'll be incorporated with her kindergarten students. So I'm going to turn it over to Spencer now for a video and information. Good evening everyone. Um, just like Leanne said, I kind of just wanted to go over a little bit about the program. Um, our hope is that you guys just see what's going on, um, you know, kind of where the rubber meets the road at the school building. Um, we're going to share with you guys what the program is and um, some numbers and then we also wanted to show you guys some testimonials from students. Um, I think that's the best way to see this program. Um, so without further ado, what is this program? Um, Picturing Writing is a thematic based, unit based program that connects painting techniques with literacy and writing development for diverse learners. And this is lifted right from the mission statement. Um, it's not a program that we developed, it's actually out of the state of New Hampshire. A woman named Beth Olchansky was an educator there for many years, and she's been doing this program and refining it since the early 1990s. Um, so we all just got trained last year as part of a district initiative um, to kind of use this program to help us serve the needs of our English language learners, our SPED students, and some of our regular ed classroom students. Um, so that would be like the diverse learners piece. Um, just to give you kind of an idea of what the program is comprised of, um, like I said, it's uh, part of these thematic units do address the Common Core State Standards. Um, so a lot of the units, some of which you'll be seeing today, the time of day unit is more of like a narrative text structure unit, whereas there are poetry units and also a um, animal stories unit, which helps the students access what a text structure is and uh, actually has them write their own story based on that. Um, the three main components of the program are painting, obviously. Um, so this is an art-based multi-skill <laughs> program. Um, we do engage the students, we're not art teachers, absolutely not. <laughs> um, but still, what we do is have the students um, paint the pictures, and this kind of sounds like fluff, but it's actually a really important part of the process because um, really what the students are doing here is creating their own texts. And this is where it really starts to meet the needs of those diverse learners, um, really seeing that um, Students who may need extra support accessing what a text actually is, they're actually making one here as part of this painting. And then that kind of serves as the basis for them to do a lot of their writing and literacy development connected to that. Um, after they do their paintings, they use a very <coughs> scaffolded process to write and revise their own writing. Um, this is really where kind of the teacher and the students are having the most interaction. Um, you'll kind of see here that the students brainstorm their pictures. So they're really looking at their, um, they, kind of set them up in frames and they're using the picture to draw out different nouns that they see in the picture and then they're brainstorming different describing words that match that. Um, then using those ideas that they have, then that's where they actually start to begin to do their descriptive writing. Um, so like I said, super scaffolded, um, very predictable. You do many of these over and over and over again so it becomes a routine 
um, which we know best practice states is good for our students as well. Um, and then the oral literacy is kind of developed through the sharing process. Um, this is my favorite part of the program because as you'll see here, like you can see how happy this kid is sharing his painting. Um, it's really like kind of promotes that community basis as well. You're using the paintings and you're using the writing um, as more of a mentor text for other students. So having the students learning each other, complimenting each other, and you're also developing students from that as well. Um, so this year at Centennial, we do have it implemented grades one through five. Um, the groups are selected based on access data criteria. Um, we have been targeting our L students and really focusing specifically on those um, that kind of just need that extra push to hopefully exit the program before they leave our school. Not that keeping them in is, of course, a bad thing, but I do think that it really addresses the language and the production that a lot of our students uh, need. Um, we have a total of 62 students this year participating, and we hope that that number grows or stays the same next year. We're kind of having to get creative because um, once the students do one program, then they kind of graduate onto the next steps, and we're going to have to kind of use the framework to see where things are going. So like I said at the beginning, the best way to experience this program is by looking at student work samples. Um, so I just have a few, and I hope this works. Anthony, you might have to say it. Um, what we did here was um, just videotape some of the students. We were hoping that they could actually come and be with us, but um, family constraints kind of put the kibosh on that. So what we did instead was just um, film some of our students reading their books. All of these are under two minutes, um, and I'll probably just kind of click back and forth. But I have three examples for you, and then we have one video that was made last year. You'll start at an intermediate grade level, then we're gonna go to a third grader, a first grader, and then we'll see some more of the first grade writing, right? I hope that these kind of fly through, but I think um, you'll notice the students being super engaged in their writing and um, their pictures as well. So I'll just let the videos speak for themselves. My name is Dylan O, and something about my book, I. I, I like mostly brainstorming and writing down ideas and picture and writing so because I like it because I get to use my imagination and using fun stuff. Let's get started. <laughs> the hills are putting on their pajamas to get ready for sleep. The sun is going down to the other side of the world. The Powder Blue River is moving like the wind as the moon is coming up and putting everyone to sleep. It is twilight. <clears throat> Next page. While the flaming, but while the flame tangerine sun is going down in Mexico, the sunflower golden sky is saying good night to the sandy hills and the prickly cactus. It, it is sunset. The puffy, wispy clouds are moving in a peaceful group. The sky blue is like the water saying hi to his friends, the clouds. The peaceful calm field is saying, staying cool. It is day. Keep going. So again, that was from our fifth grader, and you can just see how uh, excited he is to read. Um, he's kind of a character as well, but um, he wrote all of that on his own. Um, obviously, he had a little bit of uh, conferencing from his teacher, but I think that that really speaks to how successful the students can feel and how excited they are to share. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get a good enough shot of the uh, pictures, but you can also see, I think, that those really serve as a basis for uh, his writing. I'm going to show you guys a third grader, then we're going to watch a first grade video. Um, this is just one page. This one's super brief, but I think you'll be able to see at a different level as well. <clears throat> the clouds are violet, the hills are bumpy, and the and the hairy grass is green, like a stem of a rose. <laughs> and then we'll look at our first grade example. The glow of moon is a bright, shiny, shiny stars are watching. The clam giant mountain are asleep. The rocky pointy mountain are touching them. It is me. Yeah, sorry I couldn't hear that. But that was a really good example of um, one of the pictures, and you can see how vivid and detailed that is. Um, this last one is one that the creator of the program, Beth Olchansky, uses um, to kind of promote the program. This was done last year. Um, one of our former Yale teachers, Allie Larson, made this video. And I think, again, this just really shows 
um, how excited the students are. So I'll go there. are English language learners. Um, they kind of do span language levels. Uh, a lot of those kids uh, that I really wanted to capitalize on were students that sometimes in the kind of rush of daily instruction, they might just kind of fall between the cracks. I think they're really easy just to kind of sit there and be obedient and uh, listen to their teachers, but rarely are they given this kind of an opportunity to really uh, truly engage and create something that they're really proud of and then uh, share it on video with you fine folks. So. Um, yeah, I think the videos do speak for themselves, and um, you know we're really happy to have the program, and I'm really excited to report um, its efficacy when we start to see access data and MCAs this year. So, thanks again for having us. I think did we want to have some questions, or if we have any? Who developed? Not developed. Who discovered this program and brought it? Um, our director of multi that's a great question. I should give her a shout out to our director of multilingual learning here, Keisha Wellhide. Mm -hmm. She's not here tonight. Um, she was really instrumental in this process of arranging the training, getting everybody trained, and um, continues to be a good resource with Beth, the creator. So she was uh, integral to the program. 
So did I understand correctly, it started last year and then you're working through this year? Correct, yeah, we kind of piloted it last year with uh -huh. that group that you just saw with uh -huh. the first graders. Um, this is the first year that we're piloting it at uh, grades one through five. And um, our team is in a PLC right now, really looking at different ways to differentiate it across grade levels, across language levels. And you know, we're really seeing some different results, obviously, with the fifth graders and the fourth graders. Those are the grade levels that I work with compared to the ones in first grade. So. Did you have to dis displace any other uh, sort of uh, curriculum that you were delivering? Or I mean, I'm just thinking about how you managed mm -hmm. with the time and sort of sure. competing priorities. Yeah. We have an hour each day in every grade level. It's called our intervention time. So these students go and we use this as an intervention for them. So it's very targeted to which kids get in based on meta scores, based on um, just their overall performance. Mm -hmm. And the whole design of it is to move kids. And we really look at making sure they're academically at a point where they have language and they can grow. And so nothing was taken away. This is basically their hour intervention. And I have to tell you, I've been able to observe several of these classrooms both this year and last year. And it's amazing <coughs> what products these kids start producing. And I will make sure that our next uh, family event, we invite the parents to come in and the kids read their books when they're all complete, and all of you come and attend as well. Because it's, it's really neat when you see how excited they get about these books and the language, the rich language that comes from their discussions. And I'll just kind of piggyback on that. You know, all of us are also in grade levels and pushing into the classrooms. I know that that's a big model for Yale and SPED across the district. And um, I think just having that lens when we're the ones implementing this program, we kind of are intentional about bridging, you know, what happens in here with what's happening in the writing time. We've just um, across the district uh, unrolled the new literacy curriculum and writing curriculum called Lucy Calkins. So really knowing what's happening in those thematic units and being able to connect those, I think, is another opportunity. But that's a really good question. Now, we just is software. So. Um, I'm curious about two questions. So do you differentiate based on the way that one through six, do you stop at a certain level uh, access score? And then my other question is because it is, it is, it goes really parallel to what you said, Lucy Calkins and uh, drawing first, so to get those ideas flowing and then doing the brainstorming, writing, revising uh, and all of that. Do we do it as an intervention? Uh, is it a cost uh, issue? Is it that it's not going to be uh, equally helpful in a whole uh, class setting? So I'm just curious. Yeah, um, so to answer your first question, um, we decided to target the weighted levels three and above just mm -hmm. because it does kind of rely on the students having a knowledge of sentence structure and um, really feeling confident enough socially and academically in their English proficiency to kind of engage at this kind of a level. Um, so that's kind of where we got that. And we just used the data to inform the groups because we did kind of need some parameters among you know, who is participating and who will be served in another way. Um, I think as, to answer your second question, um, it's designed for all students. And Beth is really big about having it. You know, She's seen it school-wide. She's seen it in the mainstream. Um, so thinking about the intervention work they're yeah. doing at Centennial, so this is scaffolded for the three through five uh, WIDA ELL students. Um, there are other students from an ADSYS perspective who are receiving intervention, and those are typically the bottom 15% in literacy or in math. Um, then we also have reading and math interventionists in all of our schools getting that next set of kids who are above the bottom 15 percentile. And so there's a whole set of structured interventions happening during intervention time based on the needs of the students. Um, this is on top of and above and beyond what's happening with the Lucy Calkins writing curriculum that we're working with. And there's many conversations through our PLC work so that our ESL teachers are connected to the classroom teachers and the data we have that helps guide our instruction. So if we have students who need some work on ending sounds, that would be um, told to the ESL teacher through a conversation that would also be a focus in there. So we try to use our data in every aspect and our PLCs drive what instruction happens for those kids. And they have their own PLC as they're all learning through that. <coughs> Great, thank you. 
I was just going to say how much I love seeing student work and having students be able to share what they're doing with us. So I really appreciate you sharing them with us um, via video and to say a special thanks to Dylan, Kevin and Karina tomorrow for oh, sharing their art and their writing with us. It was really wonderful to see. They'll get a Kevin Thing is Awesome Award. Oh, good. <laughs> <I'm glad. laughs> Thank you again for having us. Yeah, thanks. Oh, thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you to the team from Centennial. So I'm now happy to bring um, Craig Polji, Chief Human Resource Administrative Officer, up. Um, he's going to be bringing on our team from ICS and from Ellers to also answer questions and partner in the presentation. Um, as we begin um, conversations with our community about planning and preparation for upcoming capital and facilities projects. Mr. Holgi, and he is just getting himself scanned into the computer. Very good, thank you. As Mr. Yunuski said, I am pleased to, I'm excited to be here tonight actually to celebrate our ongoing work. I was talking about earlier, it's like I was thinking about Richfield schools and how we have great things ahead. After this presentation, I think the better phrase is even greater things ahead because there are great things going on every day. But with the approval of the bond referendum by the taxpayers um, last week, as well as our operating referendum, we're excited to be here to share the next steps associated with our LTFM projects as well as our bond referendum projects. Specifically tonight, we're going to be talking about what are some key decisions that are going to have to be made in the next couple of months to make sure that we are set up and moving forward in that bond project. Um, as far as um, actions around option creators and choice makers who are going to be involved in the decision making process. What are some key things around our next steps around our bond issue associated with that as well as communication um, methods that we're going to be using to look at how do we move this project forward and then kind of the long term um, timeline as far as what gets us from here to that end project completion in three to four years when we're able to roll things out and call things complete. Um, so I'm pleased to have Pat Overham, Gary Olson and Andy, I forgot your Faulkner, <laughs> um, here to share information about um, the work that ICS is, has set up for us for moving forward. Um, information about that funding component of it from Gary Olson, and so I'd like to invite Pat up at this time. So first off, congratulations again. What an exciting deal and, and definitely a resounding show of support in the community. So kudos to the district and uh, exciting things to come. And I think as Craig mentioned, um, a lot of you are probably asking now what? We've got this exciting and major opportunity and we want to capitalize on it. and and hit the ground running. And so what we wanted to do tonight is just spend a little bit of time talking through some of the things that we've been working on behind the scenes to get you off and running from a logistical standpoint, processes, decision making, communications, and so on. So one of the first things we wanted to go through was really a decision making and committee structure that is very typical to this type of efforts that we work through with districts. And in this case, I want to see if I'm going to break it into two pieces just so it's a little more legible for you. In this case, it really aligns itself well with some of the work you've been doing with Teamworks as far as setting up categories. But from a decision making communication structure standpoint, what we're really looking at doing is establishing clear lines so that everyone, regardless of where they're at in the process, really understands their primary role and where they fit into things. So if you look at yourselves from a school board, perspective, it's really that final decision making authority. Uh, being a liaison to the community and, and constituents, but really acting as that advisory body as things move forward. The second box is what we affectionately call POC or the Project Oversight Committee and that's really your choice makers. That's really a, a small working group, if you will, that will be established and, and really will start from now and work all of the way through the process and, and that's really your ongoing working, communicating, and, and scheduling and delegating group that really serves as the basis for the entire process moving forward. The next box um, will end up consisting of a number of different committees and those will be established based on how these projects are bundled and, and phased and so on. And I think that's an important thing to, to realize. We keep referring to it as the bond project, well, it's going to end up being multiple projects. And so we've got to treat things accordingly. Um, 
Core planning or design groups will be established for some of the major bundles or projects, if you will. Some of them, some of the buildings where we're very infrastructure focused and, and kind of nuts and bolts focused, that design entity or, or process may be a little less uh, complex and, and a little less timely as some of the, the larger facilities, middle school, this facility, and so on. But it'll really be the option creators in those core design groups that take all of the user group info, all of the stakeholder input, and synthesize those into what they're seeing and working through with the architectural firm to evaluate different design solutions. Those will ultimately get fed up to the POC, the Project Oversight Committee, and then to you for final decision-making authority. The final group on the bottom, the user groups and the input, that's really the stakeholders. And I think one of the responsibilities and one of the messages that you communicated as a district throughout the referendum campaign was to be very inclusive and thoughtful in the process moving forward and to really make this an open process. And this box is really what forces you to do that, in essence. Any user groups, whether they be you know, building specific or department specific, science departments, second grade teachers, uh, facts, any of those users um, will be met with and input will be sought. And there are a number of different ways to do that, whether they're specific programs, community groups, booster groups, different advisory committees, obviously FPAC and others, those will all be groups that we'll seek input in to make sure that we're <coughs> developing comprehensive solutions. Let me just clarify one piece. Yeah. Clearly the scope of the project has been identified. That's what we submitted to the Department of Education, and so that is the scope. Those are real big picture, big pocket details. So what we're talking about here isn't so much where are we going and what are we going to do with the money, but it's what are the details? What does what do the lab spaces look like? How do we build these out? How do we implement these on an appropriate timeline? So it's the details of the actual look, feel, touch, taste of those things versus what is the scope of the project. The scope of the project is very much still aligned with what the voters have approved and what we submitted to the Department of Education and what the board has previously approved, approved as well. So just to clarify that piece. Yep, thanks, Craig. So the next step, and we touched on it earlier, I guess, is really communications as a whole. Um, you've done an excellent job to date through all of the information dissemination and getting the word out about what's included and what's being proposed. I think we've got a great opportunity to carry that forward and be very proactive both internally and externally with how we communicate and to what extent we do. Uh, some of the tools that we typically use for internal communications um, that project oversight committee, that POC committee, will be meeting typically either every other week or weekly uh, in the heat of battle, if you will. And so well-documented uh, meeting minutes for those can be publicized, and that's a great way for folks to keep a pulse on things internally. Two of the other typical practices we do are, are to provide a weekly status report, um, more of a quick hitting, here's where we're at, here's where we're going. Those are strategically circulated out to uh, building level administration, uh, basically wherever they need to be to, to get those ongoing updates out there. Um, and then monthly status reports. Those are a little more thorough look at all of the different projects as a whole and kind of how we're sitting from a, a high level schedule standpoint, budget standpoint, and any issues that need to be resolved standpoint. And those are typically, um, at the least, made public through the district website. In some cases, those are presented at school board meetings once a month, so they're televised and, and that information is out there. But again, it's another tool to make sure that we're really communicating well with constituents and everyone internally as well. External communications. Um, the district website has been a great source of information to date. We want to continue that, and it's very typical for us to use that as our holding place for all of the project related updates, documentation <coughs> details so that when folks are interested they've got a place centrally located to find all of that. Um, design presentations at school board meetings touched on that. And then strategic open houses or community input meetings at, at certain points during design where we feel it's advantageous to either test concepts or just get the word out about where progress is and where things are moving. Anything to add on that one? 
Do I skip? Timeline and development and approvals. Obviously, a lot of things happening uh, behind the scenes. Um, I think Gary will get into some of these in a little further detail. Over the next couple of months, there'll be a lot of decisions that have to be made, a lot of approvals that have to be made, either related to uh, bond sales, those types of approvals, all of the legal notices and so on. Uh, we'll get into a little more detail about some of the early design phase activities that are needing to, to get rolling as, as well as the financial pieces. Just a screenshot of what we've started building as far as some of those early communication pieces, the ongoing logistics and all of the to-do items, if you will, that we're, we're starting to get rolling on. Uh, the last two pages here are some of the major milestones by building. And you can see those are all sitting at the same spot right now. I'll talk in a little while, but one of the things that we need to establish over the next probably six to eight weeks uh, is really to get our arms around the bundling and the phasing of all of these different work scopes and, and how they interplay with your ongoing activities and a lot of the other considerations that will need to be integrated into the overall scheduling. And there's my transition, I guess, construction <laughs> bundling and, and phasing. Um, you've got your referendum scopes that Craig mentioned earlier. You've also got all of your ongoing long-term facility maintenance revenue scopes. And so we'll be working with Craig and Dan and others to really integrate those scopes into what makes sense from a procurement standpoint and from a, an implementation standpoint. Uh, compiling all of your existing documentation uh, identifying and trying to look for opportunities to expedite urgent projects and pieces where they make sense for a couple of reasons. You've got some very, we've already started this process, you've got some very high intensity or critical infrastructure needs. I think that months ago served as kind of the initiator for some of these efforts. We need to identify what potentially makes sense to be pulled out and implement it as quickly as possible so we can get some of these critical needs taken care of. At the same time, we don't want to do that just to show progress. We need it to make sense financially and we need it to make sense from a scope standpoint and an implementation standpoint. So we're working on that right now and we'll keep, keep working on that over the next few weeks. Uh, and then integration with all of your ongoing activities. Um, summer programs, your athletics, your activities, your uh, cleaning schedules, identifying all of those ancillary items that come along with a project like moving in, moving out, uh, technology, all of those pieces need to be considered, studied, and then brought forth into the mix. Uh, last slide, um, it's really just kind of some behind the scenes, uh, if you will, tools that, that we've already started developing. Um, obviously a lot of moving pieces here and it's very critical that we're accurately and, and uh, keeping current all of the tracking and monitoring and, and validation that goes along with that. Uh, it's typical for us to use a web-based platform to do that. We're already starting to populate different logs, different tracking tools so that at any given time we're able to determine exactly where we're at from a budget standpoint, exactly where we're at from a schedule standpoint, and so on. And so we're in the process of setting up an overall budget summary and all of the backups so that we're able to reconcile things with Craig and his team on an ongoing basis. Uh, Procore is that web-based platform that we happen to use. We've started an interested vendors log. Um, I don't know if you've been getting bombarded yet with phone calls, but we certainly have, and I think some of the administration have. Um, you'll get calls from locker <coughs> suppliers and painters and just about anyone you can think of. Start sending those our way and we'll track those and log them so that we can get a hold of them when the time is right to, to get them involved. Gary, do you want to jump in? So one of the things that we're, this is a move fast and then it's going to feel like we're moving slow, but then we're going to move fast again. One of the things that we're moving fast on, there's actually a couple items on the agenda tonight having to do with some of the sale of bonds on the LTFM piece, um, but then there are also a number of different other decisions that are going to be, going to be made between now 
and when we actually issued those bonds as far as how they're structured. So Gary's gonna share some of the information about some timelines associated with that, as well as some of the behind the scenes work that they're doing to help analyze how to best structure that for the most efficient operation for the district. Good evening, and again, congratulations on the successful referendum. Um, there's two items on the agenda already. They relate to the LTFM bonds. First one's a res resolution <coughs> authorizing the sale of the bonds, but the big part of that the reason we're doing it now, even though we don't know exactly when you're going to sell those bonds for sure, is that the LTFM bonds have a requirement that you publish a notice in the paper. And that notice has to be at least 20 days prior to your certification of your levy, which is going to be December 18th. So we need to get that on the res uh, get that to the paper so that it gets so we meet the 20-day publication deadline. The other resolution that's on the on the books for tonight is what's called a reimbursement resolution. Um, you may make some of your expenditures, and in this case, we're only worrying about what we call hard costs. We're not worrying about some of the design and those kinds of things, but the hard costs are you start buying materials, moving ground around, those kinds of things. If some of that happens before you get the bond proceeds, what this reimbursement resolution will allow you to do is take the bond, some of the money out of the bond proceeds and reimburse the fund that you paid those expenses out of. So that's what's going to be on the agenda for later tonight. Now, in terms of timing of the bond sales, one of the key issues is we've got a lot of bonds to sell, and the issue is, do we want to sell it all at once, or do we want to sell it in multiple issues? Um, what's the advantage of selling it in multiple issues? Um, once you sell the bonds, the interest rate, you start paying interest right away on the, on the bonds. So if you sell all the bonds at once, you're paying interest on all those costs from day one till you spent all the money. Um, the other, uh, on the other side of the coin, is if you split it up, you only pay the interest on the second issue once you sell the second bond issue. So if you sell one now and one a year from now, you're gonna save the interest costs on that portion of the bonds for, for a year. So it depends on how long, how, so there's some potential savings there. On the other side of the coin, uh, you're going to lose some investment income. If you sell all the bonds at once, you've got more money to invest. Unfortunately, probably the interest rate on the reinvestments is going to be lower than the interest you're paying on the bonds. So you, there's kind of a trade-off there. <laughs> and in reality, probably you're, gonna, you're going backwards on that. But the biggest key against about not doing that is interest rate risk. We know right now market rates are very, very low. If we wait, if we sell half the bonds now and half later, we don't know what that interest rate is going to be six months from now or a year from now. That might wipe out the potential savings from not having to pay the interest for that first year on that first, on that second set of bonds. So that's kind of what we have to look at is all those factors. Um, another factor that falls into this is the timing of the projects. When do we need the money? Um, you know it. This, this isn't all going to happen overnight. They're not going to, this is going to take, what, about three years or more to, to finish the project. So we don't need all the money right now. If we had a crystal ball, it'd be great. We'd say, okay, we know interest rates are going to be low here, and the project timing says we need, we need bond money here. You know, we, we could, you could do an ideal planning for the bond issue. Unfortunately, at this point, we don't have exactly where the timing of the priority of the projects yet, and we don't have a great crystal ball as to where interest rates are necessarily going to be, other than knowing that they're very low right now. Um, and the one last thing is, if you split it up into multiple issues, there will be some additional cost of issuance because you're going to pay uh, additional, each time you sell bonds, you're going to pay for a, a bond rating from Moody's Investor Service. You're going to pay for an extra fee for your bond counsel to write your opinion. You're going to pay an extra fee for your financial advisor to market and sell the bonds. So, um, so those are all factors that need to be analyzed and kind of take a look at it and say, okay, what if we do sell all the bonds at once? Here's what we think we're gonna be, and here's where our interest earnings are and your interest costs and all that's gonna be. Okay, what if we split it based on some kind of a reasonable idea about timing of when the projects are? What happens if we split it into two issues? How do these factors all balance out? What outweighs what in terms of are you are you better off and how much market, you know, what, what what's the market rate risk if it goes up? You know, like say quarter of a point or half a point or a full point, we can do some analysis like that to say, you know, what's the real cost of, you know, what's the danger of delaying 
you know, if, if interest rates go up. So that's kind of the analysis we need to do in terms of trying to decide whether it makes sense to sell all the bonds at once or do it in multiple issues. A lot of districts do sell them all at once. A lot of districts are very adverse to, to that interest rate risk. So, um, but I think we ought to at least give you some information to make a kind of a, at least an informed decision as to what might make sense for you on that. Uh, as far as board meeting dates, you, you do have a board meeting on December 4th. Maybe at that time we could have some discussion about looking at some of those factors and kind of seeing where they are, uh, or at least starting to prepare to do that. December 18th, you have to certify your final levy. That has, that's your board meeting to certify your levy. And on that levy, you will have a levy for the LTFM bonds. In fact, that was already, already put on your proposed levy. So there's already a dollar amount in there, was in there for your proposed levy. But since you hadn't passed the election yet, there was no issue on, there was no dollar amount in, in the levy for the voted bond issue. So we'll have to come up with a number for that and add that in before the December 18th meeting. Um, at that meeting, if we're ready, and we've gone through the analysis and everybody's comfortable, at that time we could authorize the sale of, of the bonds, either the LTFM bonds or the building bonds or both. Um, and if we did that, it takes about three to four weeks at least after that before we can actually have the sale. And I think your only meeting in January is early in the month, if I remember right. Currently, Currently unless you change and add a second meeting. If you did add a second meeting, we could maybe do it the second, you know, if you wanted to move ahead fairly rapidly, we could have a second, second meeting late January or that first meeting in February, at which time we would take the bids and uh, authorize the actual sale of the bond. So that's kind of, you know, just one idea about timing. Certainly we're, we're flexible on that and we're just trying to figure out what makes sense. And part of it may depend on how quickly, how quickly we can do some, put some of this other information together so you can uh, have, a, have some choices in terms of what makes sense. Does that help? Can, yeah, um, can we, just a couple things. You'd mentioned providing some information on the, the market risk or the interest rate risk. Mm -hmm. um, if you could get us that and include things like, you know, around where we are relative to historical lows and things like that yeah. and, you know, things that have moved, how it's moved over the last couple of years, that would well, be helpful. Yeah, we have, we have a graph that we call the bond buyer index that we can show you kind of over. Okay. To uh, like a five-year period, what's happened to that? And then what we could do is, you know, we, we we assumed a certain rate in the in in the election stuff, and we had a little bit of a cushion in there. We we'll reevaluate that, say where we think is more accurate now, and then say, okay, if we if we split it and we get that rate for the first set of bonds, and the the second set of bonds is you know half a percent higher, or what you know what is that? How does that how does that work out? You know, that's kind of that's kind of I think the analysis we need to do for you. That makes sense. Yep. Could you also go through the the, the timing rela relating to the December eighteenth and the our, our levy finalization? Yeah. If we missed that, does that mean we'd have to wait a year to implement? If you if you don't put if you don't put any kind of levy on, then the only other option would be we would be selling the bonds. We would have to you, we could set that first payment up <laughs> so it was interest only. Right. But then you'd have to take that to pay the interest. You'd have to take that out of the bond proceeds. Okay. Thank you. So the actual bond issue doesn't occur until January or February, so later on down the road. So anything that we're putting on the levy are associated or estimates associated with that projected bond issue. Mm -hmm. um, it's a matter of having enough information and a recommendation of what's happening on the 18th. Um, from a timing standpoint, um, in working with Ellers, kind of that late January or February timeline seems to be the optimal timeline for municipal bonds to be issued. Um, given when they're expiring and so that's another kind of pending factor as far as why we have some urgency about moving this project forward because that tends to be the time that the best rates are coming in um, because others are expiring and new ones are avail available to be issued at that time. So there's a lot of bonds that mature on February 1st, you know, that's when you make your payments. And so the investors, they're getting paid back for the their investment on, on a bond. Now they're looking for another place to, to put their money. So there's usually pretty high demand in, in the, that early part of the year for for municipal bonds. So um, as far as next steps, really kind of one of the big things is uh, Pat talked about earlier, it's identifying that decision making process. And clearly there are a lot of items that are going to be coming to the board for decisions as far as awards of contracts or things like that, that are part of that process, especially in the professional services piece, seeing the broad scale project designs and that work. 
Um, but then there is that additional team of the Project Oversight Committee, or the POC, which we've called our Construction Committee here in Richfield in the past, but that generally has one to two board members that are participating on that committee. I think John is um, one of the identified reps on that at this point, um, but it could be one or two representatives for more of the detailed, um, either weekly or bi-weekly reports and kind of decisions that need to be made in the interim of those board meetings so that that project and that level of detail is able to be seen. Um, and then information coming back to the board that provides more of the highlights and overview of some of those pieces. So identifying representation from the board um, and then knowing that we are gonna be working on communications because this first year, a lot of it's the design work or a lot of it's gonna be the behind the scenes or in the tunnels work that people don't really see. And so we wanna make sure that people see that we are moving this project forward, that there are things that are taking place even though buildings and things like that might not be changing significantly, um, especially significantly down the road. Um, but looking at kind of how do we show that progress and that work that uh, the district is using and that community then can see that these are aligned with the things that we asked for um, and aligned with what their reports are as well, um, as well as the financial components associated with that um, and then starting that um, long scale timeline. So any other questions? Otherwise, really just wanting to let you know that we're up and rolling and moving forward and um, if there's opportunity for input or feedback, we'd love to hear that. So. Um, you answered one of my questions, which is whether there would be board representation on the Project Oversight Committee. But I would love to know more about whether the Project Oversight Committee or the core planning or design groups do have opportunities for community engagement and for people, whether they were on the option <coughs> creator group over this last year or community members who are eager to be involved in this to actually participate in those groups. And if so, how and when we anticipate that will happen? Yep, I can jump in. So, great question, and I think community input is gonna be a huge key to the success of this with what's been communicated. Two real ways for anyone in the community at large to get involved. The design committees at some of the larger sites will inevitably have community participation, but more so in those user group or stakeholder meetings, those will be, there will be literally dozens of those meetings with everyone and anyone who wants to provide input and wants to be a part of the process. So uh, both internally and community wise. And then the other thing we talked about too, um, even if it's not in those individual committees, but having some open houses or kind of a show and tell where when we get to the design work, we can roll out some of those images so people can see what that work looks like or what some of that design looks like and give just informal feedback as part of that process too. So broader community, as well as those who have a key stake in individual components of it. Yeah, I would like to see student input too. I think would Absolutely. be another place to look. Any other questions? All right, thank you guys very much. So we are moving on to transportation. transportation. Mr. Holji again. Thank you. Um, we have had a number of changes to transportation in our efforts to work efficiently and to um, move our progress forward as well as changing our school start times and things like that. Um, what we would like to do is provide an overview of our transportation program here um, so that there's an understanding of the scope of the work that the transportation department is doing and then talk about what are some of the efficiencies that we've been working towards, what are some of the ongoing issues and concerns that we have that we're trying to address as well as what are some of the next steps that we're taking a look at. Um, so as we move forward, um, I asked Dan Kretzinger to come and share the highlight of the transportation program. You know, what is that capability and what does the program look like? And then we'll drill into some of those other items later on. So. Craig. And good evening. Um, so we'll get started here. So just a quick overview of what this looks like. Um, currently in our inventory of our fleet, um, we have uh, 36 vehicles that we use for transporting students. Six of those vehicles are um, vehicles that don't require a special driver's license. So we, uh, they call those uh, type three vehicles. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. This is a, a kind of a summary of the uh, number of routes that we um, uh, take care of for students on a daily basis. So <clears throat> not only do we take care of our own schools, we also take care of um, Blessed Trinity, uh, partnership and then we also have a whole host of, of other um, uh, services that we take care of as well 
So as you can see, we have uh, roughly 219 total trips every day that we need to route. And um, logistically, it's, um, it's, it's very intense, it's detailed, and we need to make sure that everything lines up well so our students get to school uh, like they should. Um, some of our additional programming that we take care of is all listed here. Um, athletic trips, that's a big piece. Again, those things aside from the other uh, routes that we talked to you about, um, these are on top of those the 219 routes that we have listed in the previous slide. So athletic trips, field trips, um, that's most of these things happen on a daily basis, just um, different pieces of these happen throughout the week. So it's not a routine type of a thing, but um, athletic trips is a, is a big one. Um, field trips is another one. Um, and then our special services shuttles is another big piece where we transport students who need uh, different, different um, speech therapy and, and uh, uh, math assistance and that type of thing. <clears throat> so part of what we do as well is we coordinate all of the contracted transportation for special ed. Um, we have 80 special education routes and approximately 60 um, homeless highly mobile routes and those go all over the Twin Cities and uh, some into some rural areas in the state as well. Um, we have 224 students that uh, currently ride uh, with our contracted transportation companies. Um, part of the, some of the things that we do is we work with the teachers, we work with um, uh, the parents and we make sure that um, everything is, is handled according to their IEP requirements, whether it's hand-to-hand -hand, uh, transfer or eye-to-eye, -eye, that type of a thing, and we want to make sure that those students have someone there um, at the location when they're dropped off. So that's a big piece of what we do. This is a chart um, basically showing um, in your uh, board packets, you, you probably have a, a larger chart that shows highly detailed of what each bus does. This is a more condensed version of that. Um, the first box on the top left is our morning routes and the services that we provide there. The second box to your right is our midday routes and the afternoon routes to the bottom left and then um, our evening activity buses on the bottom right. <clears throat> our drivers um, per week uh, roughly put in uh, 400 or 750 hours a week. Um, we have a variety of drivers, um, many who are retired and, and, uh, and they're limited in their hours by uh, pensions and social security benefits and that type of thing. Um, we also have some split shift drivers um, who, uh, have, who work full time for the district and say half of their shift is, is a custodian or laundry worker. Um, they will also help drive for us as well. And then uh, later route schedules um, are, are less desirable for some drivers, so we sometimes run into issues with that, but um, that's just a little bit of, of how we schedule our drivers. Um, this chart shows the average student counts per bus. Um, in that first column there is our bus number. It will be all the way to the left. The uh, middle number on that is the capacity of that particular bus when it's when we're, when we're um, uh, busing elementary age students, um, we can, like bus number one up there, we can shuttle um, 90 passengers for elementary kids. And then um, somewhere in kind of in the middle of the uh, middle school age group, um, that number will change because the students are getting bigger and require a little more room. Middle ages. <laughs> Middle ages, yes. Into high school, so that bus capacity changes. So we go up two to a seat then. And that's what that third column is for there. Um, the, the, the fascinating and nice thing about this is we have found, going through this process, that we have found some, some areas that we were able to make changes on already and some other areas that we need to make improvements on as well. So it's, uh, it's been a good process. 
just, just to highlight quickly on that one piece. So what the Transportation Department did um, earlier this year when we found out there was some overloading on some of the buses is they did an actual, I think it was six or seven days that they analyzed, and I think the bus drivers sat with clickers on their buses and counted the kids as they were coming on each one of those routes to help us understand exactly how many kids were going on. Um, our system didn't always identify all the kids that were riding that bus, and so they used this information. This was the information from that early October timeline, and they've already made some adjustments to some of these routes to help mitigate that. Correct, and we also check on a weekly basis too with the clickers, and we're counting students to make sure that um, we're staying within within the lines that we want to be in. Excuse me, Dan. Yes. You, you the, there's three of the buses here, the the 30 passenger special ed buses that. Did, did, does that just mean they aren't used for these schools and they're used for other purposes of, during the, you know, the, the yeah. morning and, and that's, afternoon? That's a great question. Um, those are our, our special needs buses, and they're well um, within their capacity range, and so those we we didn't get on there in those in that uh, in the slide. So, um, but they're. Um, they're in, but I'm asking, are they in use at the at the usual they time? They are. I'm are. sorry. Okay. Yes, they are. I apologize. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, since Tim asked, I'll ask my yes. question on this slide too. So it sounds as though we do not currently have any buses that are over populated. I don't know what the right term to use is um, because of the adjustments that have been made since those problems were identified. Mm -hmm. But what happens if there is a day or a series of days where more kids decide to ride the bus? Um, what do we do in those instances just to make sure that everybody is safe uh, when they are on our buses? Yeah, and this happens every day for us. So we get different capacity amounts and our drivers let us know um, when we have issues um, with capacity and we make adjustments on the fly as we go. And if we have to move some students around, we, we, we do that through a blackboard with the, in coordination with the school. So we, we ran into this last year um, with our pay to ride buses as well as um, some of our high school buses that were getting overcrowded due to students that were walking out of the walk zone and into the bus zone to grab a bus because it was shorter for them to go outside the walk zone. So we had to make some adjustments on that and that's, that's just part of our, our day to day process. Just, can I just ask one more? Did, yeah. Um, Bus nine for the high school seems to be over capacity on average. It's at, it's at 44 and a half. Yes. And yep. Capacity is 42. So that is well, another one of I imagine they're the big kids, John. <laughs> yes, they're big kids. And, uh, and I said some of these numbers have already been changed. Okay. And we have made some adjustments with that already. So thanks. It's a dynamic process. It's always moving. And we're constantly trying to make it better. And uh, so every any time we see things like this, we, we make adjustments right away to, to accommodate for that. Did you want to jump in here? I'll jump okay. in here. So, so in, in the midst of our budget cuts over the last couple of years, one of the things the Transportation Department was charged with was try to identify some efficiencies. And so in addition to just the general school schedules changing when we moved the middle school and high school to the end, we also um, access some new software that's available a couple years ago and tried to implement that looking at who is living within certain route zones and how do we route them onto the specific buses. Um, so some of those efficiencies, um, we've ended our choice transportation because we no longer have students enrolled through the choice program where the um, transportation is provided for. Um, we previously had been running two routes into Minneapolis and so that helped free up some capacity. Um, we also have looked at our staffing and how do we take positions that could be either full-time or part-time but blend them with bus driver positions in the district um, so that we are sharing those resources and hiring full-time employees into those positions as well. One of those positions last, I think it was last year, we had um, cut a, the laundry worker who had resigned or retired at that point and made that a part-time position just because of the number of uniforms and things like that that were being washed as part of that process. We were able to align that with the transportation driver, create a full-time position um, that then was serving two needs within the district. Um, improve, improve the utilization of the routing software. 
um, really kind of looked at how do we tighten and reduce those route schedules. Right now we have some routes where we have some at capacity or maximizing those, those areas. We also have seen in the past that there were some and there are still some that are underutilized. Um, some of that is going to be changed as we move forward as we move into the pay to ride services and things like that and more kids will be getting onto those buses specifically. Um, but looking at how do we maximize that software system and our transportation schedules for efficiencies. Um, decreased overall number of bus stops, really that efficiency of moving kids through the system and getting them to school as quickly as possible and getting them home as quickly as possible. And then also increase those load counts so that we're using our um, vehicles um, at their potential. Um, now despite those efficiencies and maybe because of some of those efficiencies we have some issues or concerns that have popped up um, and we've lost some of the flexibility as we try to tighten up our efficiencies in this area. Um, one of those things and we knew about it but we didn't exactly know how it was going to impact us was that construction on 66th Street routing to side streets that required slower transportation and slower movement um, and so that was obviously a big impact impacting Richfield across the board um, but impacting our transportation schedules during those prime times as well. Um, as we look to change the schedules and to realize as much efficiency, one of the things that um, it seems is our schedules have gotten a little bit too tight. <clears throat> we have some arrivals and um, departures from schools that any, anything that misses in that process can delay an arrival at a school, delay a pickup, or delay students getting to school on time. Um, and so trying to create some flexibility is one of the things that we're going to be looking at moving forward. Um, student behavior management. Um, is one of the things that they've been working on but continues to be a concern especially on certain routes of how do we kind of make sure that students are well behaved on that school bus we have drivers that are in charge of as you saw 55 60 kids on a bus um, that's one adult to 55 or 60 kids that um, being able to watch what's happening on the school bus and you know pay attention to your driving capacity is a challenge and so um, they've been bringing in Leanne Weiss has done some trainings on behavior management for the bus drivers and help support that work um, Dan and his team and the bus drivers have been working with the building administrators to address those concerns specifically um, but that seems to be something that we're continuing to work on as well. Um, one of the things with our addition of our preschool programming and our kindergarten programming is we require that the bus drivers are seeing the parent before they're letting the kid off and leaving that bus stop. Um, as well as in our special education program we have a similar situation where if that parent isn't there at that time of drop off that delays the whole process. That requires a call back to dispatch to notify the parent and sometimes it requires those bus drivers to be routing back through um, or finding another way to get that kid home so that it doesn't delay everybody as well. So working with the parents to make sure that they're there, holding them accountable and setting up processes in place so that we are running as efficiently as possible. Um, everybody would like a bus stop right outside their door um, but that doesn't help us run efficiently and that doesn't help us get all the kids to school on time and so addressing parent concerns when there is a need to do that but then also modifying that as well. We talked a little bit about the pre-k -kid, pre kids program um, combined in with the regular routes and knowing which kids can get off without a parent and which kids have to have a parent there is something that the bus drivers are having to see and monitor on a daily basis especially on those elementary routes. Um, walk zone students riding the bus, we talked about that is um, we've had kind of a flexible piece of if you can get to a bus stop, you know, nobody's going to ask the question because we're here to serve and unless it's hitting capacity, what we're finding is now some of those are hitting capacity. So how do we monitor that to make sure that our policies are being administered correctly? The board has approved a policy of what the walk zones are and what the transportation routes are and things like that, but making sure that we are adhering to that so that um, we are able to be efficient, we are able to monitor that policy and we have some ideas on how we can do that moving forward. Um, you may have heard across the board that there is a driver shortage. Um, school bus drivers, um, transportation drivers, MTC drivers I think are all kind of running at maximum right now but we continue to monitor that. We see other school districts are in a very similar situation so we're working to address those concerns and making sure that we're fully staffed and have a backload of staff when people are sick or absent or not able to be there. Um, insurance students are getting on the correct bus. Um, every once in a while it happens where a kid is going home and gets on the wrong bus or you know somebody's not seen that so working through those pieces and then we continue to one of the exciting things is we continue to add preschool programming and we're committing to making sure that all of our kids and all of our families can be served but looking to meet the needs of those transportation so as we're now transporting three-year-olds in preschool programs and things like that those are all additional programs that we haven't been delivering in the past so we're looking at solutions um, for how they fit into that schedule of the 219 plus routes every time we add those routes we need to be aware of that as well. 
And then some of the improvement opportunities that we continue to monitor and look at, um, looking at compensation and driver incentives, we continue to monitor that marketplace, be aware of that um, as we move into future contract negotiations and things like that, making sure that we are efficient, that we are appropriate within that market. Um, we're also competing with some other organizations outside of schools where they're offering driver's incentives, hiring incentives, and things like that that might move them into another position, but then um, compensation differs that way as well. Um, equipping buses with GPS systems and student tracking. This is something Dan, I think, has been talking to me about is we have to know who's on our buses. We need to know where those buses are. And so we've started to implement some of that technology as it's become available, um, both in a GPS system where we know where each one of our vehicles are moving across the district so that we know if they're on routes. And that helps us realize some efficiencies because we can track where there are delays specifically to that. But then also um, looking at student tracking is another opportunity. Um, it may slow down some of the tracking, but it also helps us make sure that we know who's getting on the buses, that they're supposed to be getting on the buses that they're getting on. Um, those missing students at the end of the day, especially that week one, if, we, if they're scanning onto that bus and we know who's on that bus, we'll know exactly where they're at. Um, that comes with an investment, and it's a technology investment um, as part of that, but something that we continue to look at. Looking at additional supervision, either volunteers or staff to work um, and supervise and monitor those buses where there maybe are some behavior management issues so that the bus drivers can really focus on their job driving. Um, looking at other alternative ways to do staffing, so um, hiring additional Type 3 drivers that don't have the same requirements for licensure as somebody who's driving a 90 passenger vehicle, um, but hiring individuals to drive some of those smaller vehicles so that we can make sure that we're using our licensed drivers um, at full capacity looking at the schedules um, in start times and end times across the district for next year. Um, looking at also from that behavior management side, I'm working with all of the buildings so that all of the students are being trained on consistent behavior management expectations. And they all have similar expectations for what happens if they are behaving, misbehaving on the bus and how those are handled and um, taken care of um, following that startup. And then um, finally looking at continuing professional development funding and training and other opportunities to continue to learn and grow the program and be the lifelong learners that we promote in a school district. So um, that's kind of a highlight of the program. I think we're available for any additional questions, but kind of wanted to share the work that's being taken place in transportation and all of the efforts and really the complexity of what it takes to get you know, 4,000 kids to school um, on time and in an appropriate place as well as the other s programs that we're serving. So, thank you. Well, uh, being in the classroom, I <clears throat> may have or may have not lost the kid once. <laughs> <laughs> There's um, no blame, no blame. Just once. <laughs> I, I know there's a lot of work that goes into that and, and the logistics. I do have a question. When you, we talk about bus capacity, uh, Something very important is uh, safety, because if the driver has to pay attention to this, mm -hmm. then safety is a, is a very concern. So I'm curious to know if we have any policies about you know uh, repeated misbehaviors. Do we have a suspension policy for from buses only, not necessarily from school? Uh, and if we do any sort of uh, systematic training in classrooms with teachers, when you, you take like a day on a Friday and we like role play maybe, uh, you know, what we're supposed to do in the bus and why we do it, maybe tie it with the citizenship unit, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm just curious to see how that works here. I think that's one of the things we're suggesting. Um, I think that there is some training that's being done in some of the buildings and some of the classrooms and how do we move that forward. But looking to make sure that, and um, I think one of those things is each one of those buildings has some guidelines that align with their work. Um, but one of the challenges is a bus driver who's getting on and has students from multiple different buildings that um, are loading that building to make sure that those students have consistent expectations so the drivers know, here's the process, here's the way that we're followed, here's the anticipated um, follow-up that we can expect from those buildings um, when they're following up with their parents and making sure that the kids are learning their lessons moving forward and are able to manage that appropriately. So I don't know if you have anything yeah, else. And, and, uh... Part of the, the procedure that we do is when there's an issue on the bus, some of our buses thankfully now have, have uh, camera systems in them so we can review those cameras, see what student it is that's causing the issue or students um, and then our drivers will write a report and then they'll turn that into us. We'll, um, depending on the situation, we'll take that video and send it to the principal of that school and then they'll review that and they kind of handle that internally. That's kind of why we're looking at developing a, a 
we want it so students kind of know what to expect for a behavior issue. So if you do this, this is these are some of the possible circumstances that'll fall from those, um, and that's why we're trying to trying to get a, a district wide plan together so um, principals kind of know how to handle that, um, and there's an expectation that um, that our that our, our bus drivers are aware of that. Um, and how we'll proceed with, with those students as well. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. And we continue on with more of Holchi. I think I have one more report here, and then we'll get to some action <laughs> items later on. So some of this information you've seen, um, and you do have in your packet a staffing report, um, but there was some information that we generally will share as part of the enrollment and staffing report combination. Um, we've seen this in previous things as we looked at it in October. We focused specifically on our October 1 counts as it related to projection and related to the previous year. Just to highlight, 4,231 K through 12 and special education students, 4,401 pre-K through 12 and special education. And you can see that breakdown of elementary, middle school, high school, pre-kindergarten and transition plus. In a nutshell, it really dri drives down to we have 86 students more than projection with our VPK included in that. And we have 62 students more than projection when we factor out that addition of the VPK students. So we received 20 more slots or 24 more slots as part of our VPK programming this year, um, just to try to show an apples to apples comparison because we did, know, did not know that we were gonna get those slots. If we didn't have the slots, we wouldn't have those students available and enrolled in the program. Um, when we drill down and look at our actual year, we have 20 students more than 2016-17 with the VPK and a slight reduction of really just four students um, when we factor out that VPK addition. Um, just a couple ways to look at it, and we've looked at this graphically in the past. Um, we really have leveled out again. Um, after a couple of years of decline um, in our enrollment, um, we see almost identical traditional enrollment when we look at apples to apples comparisons. Um, that second bar of the 17 in 2016 and um, 11 in 2017 <coughs> represents early childhood special education students who are actually counted in our VPK programming as well. So they're enrolled in those VPK programs and they're participating in that and so they count as the VPK. Um, they would have previously counted in our traditional enrollment, but now they're counted in that VPK program. And then the top bar, that tan bar, is our VPK students, and you can see that that is also a group that's growing as well. And then just something, and um, it kind of aligns to some of the staffing work that we'll be talking about as well, but this just shows trends by different grade levels. Um, you can see our elementary trend is trending downward. Um, our secondary and our middle school and um, high school are trending slightly upward. And then our K2 and our 3-5 are kind of doing a crossover on where their um, enrollment is at. But in general, the elementary is trending downward slightly. Secondary, middle school, and high school are trending upward. And then that bottom black line represents the VPK students and that enrollment in that program. We've seen that before, um, but we haven't seen it in those kind of graphic representations. Um, we're going to move on to staffing at this point in the interest of time and then answer any questions at the end. Good evening. You all have the annual staffing report in your board packets, and that goes into the detail of how we are staffed as a district as a whole. So I want to share with you a couple of slides tonight that just summarizes that data for you. And looking at this first slide, you can see that we're at 659 employees for the year. And that equates to about 595 full-time FTEs. So 345 of that are teachers, and you'll see by category there where it breaks it down by the count of the staff first, and then the full-time FTEs by each work group that we have in the building. This slide says that we have an increased total of 11 employees by count for the year, which equates to about 8.5 FTEs. As you look through this information, you'll see that those increases are primarily in paraprofessionals, a little bit in facilities, nutrition, office personnel, outreach workers. We do have the decrease of 6.3 teachers in, uh, or teachers for FTEs there. Our primary increases this year where we're seeing them is based in the early childhood programs, as you know, with the increase of the pre-K program there, as well as a little bit in secondary at the high school with the seven period day, we had a small increase there as well in staffing. This shows by building what the increases and decreases are, and again, this supports with the two increases there, the third and fourth bullets. You'll see the middle school and senior high, secondary, those are where some of those increases are coming in 
um, as well as the central office, you'll see the 8.6. Again, that's where all, that's the building that all of our uh, early childhood program and pre-K is mostly based out of there as well. So then we take that data and we break it down a little bit further and uh, look at, start to look at our diversity counts over the last three years, so 2015, 16, and 17, to see where we are by staff of color within the school district. So this representation here will show you that since 2015, we slowly started increasing our staff of color in the school district each year. Although our total number of staff is declining, we are seeing some percentage increases in our staff of color in the different areas where we've been tracking that. And then this graph here will show you by percentage of staff what our ethnicity looks like. And again, you can see that we're increasing. By the time we get to 2017, we are starting to show some uh, percentage increases in our staff of color in the district. Um, decrease again in our white staff as a whole with uh, primary increases in Latino and Hispanic and also in our black and African American staff. Just in full disclosure on that last part, that bottom one was 85%, so it's not represented proportionally on that graph. <laughs> I was um, going to make that comment. <laughs> I knew somebody was going to do it. And we, it's, it's the only way we could get it to show up on the slide that way, but it basically cuts off and shows the breakout of um, the specific staff of color within those demographic areas. But that bottom one, it's 86.95%, 87.46% um, um, white, and then went um, down to 85.13%. So we do see that increase in um, staff of color within that area. And the increase is to be celebrated. So to be clear, it's, it's really great. And the one question I had about this, which I appreciate very much, um, is whether or not we could get a breakdown of the different type of staffing groups by ethnicity and uh, you know i'm especially thinking about our 345 teachers and and does the diversity of our teaching force mirror the diversity of our staff overall or are there gaps by our different staffing group types is something that i would be interested to see we can certainly pull that data for you we separate it out in our star report every year by licensed staff and non-licensed staff we do have approximately 14 or 15 administrators that are included in that licensed staff piece. So and we can separate it out by administrator as well. So we can get that data for you. It, it, it's not perfectly clean data, so we didn't feel comfortable putting it up here at this point because we don't have our STAR report data back yet. Um, but when we look at where who we believed is included in that STAR report, um, we saw an increase from 7% to 8% of staff of color within the teaching group and the administrative group. Um, which is up from about five to six percent, you know, five to six years ago. So we are seeing that progressive growth in those areas. Um, Star Report pulls it into collectively that area, and we haven't, um, because of our changing information systems and things like that, we don't have that same history that we do in specific categories. We're having to create it with those external measures. Okay. No further questions. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we move on to a conversation about the Richfield Legislative Platform. Um, in our last couple of meetings, we've talked about the AMSD draft legislative platform. Um, the AMSD, of which I'm a member of the Legislative and Executive Committee, um, it's Association of Metropolitan School Districts, um, and it's in a consortium where we work to influence the legislative platform statewide. Um, conversations at um, the AMSD legislative platform level around stabilizing funding, um, reforming and stabilizing the Teacher Retirement Association Fund, um, increasing and diversifying the teacher workforce, enhancing taxpayer equity, uh, reducing mandates and enhancing local control, um, and then ensuring state safe and modern school facilities. Um, as a district, what we typically do is have a conversation about three or four top priorities for ourselves and for our legislative platform. Um, as we've talked about in the last couple meetings, my strong suggestion is that we partner up in at least a couple of the areas um, because two of the things that are on the list from AMSD are things that we have specifically focused on. Um, one related to funding has to do with special education cross subsidy. Um, and so I'm suggesting to our team that we have um, reducing the special education cross subsidy. Um, and just for those who are watching, to understand what a special education cross subsidy is, um, currently, there are mandates and expectations for us to serve all of our special education students, but there isn't the funding that goes with it. Um, and so a cross-subsidy is when you take money from one pot um, to pay for another pot. And so our general education funding um, is taken from the all-student category, um, and there are millions of dollars that are then utilized to um, support our special ed students to make sure that we're serving their needs. And we absolutely want to serve their needs, 
um, but we also want to have the funding that goes with that. Um, and so this is an issue statewide. All districts are struggling with that. Uh, approximately 52% of the state and federal funding cover our special ed services, um, and the other 48% is made up out of that general ed pot that we pulled to serve those students. Um, and so I'm suggesting that that is one of our platform issues. Um, and then if we also look at increasing teacher diversity across the state, um, one of the things that we just learned in our staff report is we're doing well in slowly um, and methodically increasing the diversity of our staff. Um, it's happened over the last several years, but the reality statewide is there's approximately 4% teachers of color across the state of Minnesota. Um, we have approximately 8% licensed staff of color um, and somewhere in the seven, seven and a half range of teachers of color. Um, and what we need to do is increase the uh, pool of candidates from across the entire state. Um, we're going to do our best to go out and hire the best and brightest and to diversify our workforce. Um, we also want the state to continue to focus on that. So two of the things I'm suggesting um, connected to past conversations we've had and our strategic plan are um, working on reducing the special education cross subsidy and also increasing the workforce, the diversity of the workforce. So looking to board members for input on one or two other areas for us to really focus on so we can then bring that back, uh, ratify that, and then use that in a conversation with both our city council, our mayor, but then also our legislators. Thoughts, board members? So I'm, I'm very supportive of both of the uh, proposals that you make. I'm particularly interested in um, uh, efforts to increase the diversity of the workforce. I do feel that um, we are very well positioned to be a big player in that, um, uh, especially if, if we can incent um, young people, uh, you know, our students, um, to be looking at uh, careers in education. Um, and so I think that that's, presumably that'll be our path to success in that area. Um, did want to just mention to other board members to consider um, one item that is on this list that has had some attention at AMSD from other districts, and I think it does resonate with our students, is the uh, MCA uh, at, at the high school level. Um, and, uh, you know, that is part of the AMSD platform to allow, um, uh, let me see if I can find the exact wording, allow uh, local school districts to use a nationally uh, normed um, college entrance examination uh, to replace the high school MCA exam, mm -hmm. um, which I think um, is something that so has gathered some uh, some energy and some momentum. Um, there are some what feel like sort of bureaucratic hurdles uh, to clear in that area, um, which I which seem to be well under the control of the state legislature, um, and so I think that that would be a piece that I'd like to see us advocate for. Concurrence or other thoughts? I would agree. Is when there's an <coughs> option available that is nationally normed, I think it's wise to, to go that way. Or I'm curious if our high school. So this senior. would be like, this would be using like the ACT in place of Correct. MCA testing. Yes. Correct. And so like would the what data would the school be collecting? Like we have, I know Richfield High School has like every student take uh, the state and district test or whatever. Uh, but like, would we collect data across like the multiple sitting because ACT, yeah. Yep, so that, that would definitely be a thought on that is to, you know, do you use the uh, average score, the top score, um, and how that, how that were, were to play out? Or would you just use the single score from you know, from you know, if it was just administered once in April, um, I think part of the part of the proposal from AMSD is also has to do with um, providing funding for the state to provide funding for all 11th grade students okay. to take that test. Um, so it might be that that one, you know, sort of opportunity to, you know, as a, as the because of course we're also looking at the difference between an accountability test. You know, we would be using ACT in two ways it would obviously would still be a college entrance exam for those students but it would also be the state accountability test um, and so we're using it for that purposes is there anything that <coughs> i feel like i'm asking this in a, in a loaded or leading kind of way but i'm really not <laughs> trying to um, is there value that you get from the mca as opposed to the act or sat um 
I've only ever taken the ACT, but I would say that like it would be nice to not have to like focus on the MCA because it's less, I feel as though it's less applicable to your immediate future. It's more of just like a test you have to take so that the state has uh, data. And I know from what I'm aware, like some students don't take it seriously at all. Like they'll come in and they'll just kind of like fill in whatever bubbles because it has no like actual effect on them. Unless they like, now I think the MNCQ system requires uh, that we send MCA scores. So I know that may affect it, but uh, I know for a lot of students, like they don't really care. They come in and they just like, they don't take the test as seriously because it has no actual uh, meaning. So I think moving to the ACT would also help address that issue as well since students, at least to college bound students, I I'm not sure to what extent, but I think that's an interesting um, thing to consider. And I I I'd be interested to see how um, that affects our scores overall. Thank you. So I, I would also agree with what uh, the, the idea that as Peter put forth and, and, and Matthew seems to support. I, I think it may, I, I've read all the articles about students not taking it seriously and a lot of opt outs in, ver in various communities in the state trying to combat that with, with penalties for districts where, where there are opt outs. I mean, if, if there exists an exam or some sort of test that can validate something and it would serve another purpose, um, I don't know why we would insist on two separate exams. Mm -hmm. Other things from the list, I know that like at the, at the state level, the, the pension retirement funding was, was talked about last year as, you know, I don't know if it's a priority, but it was brought up and that the concern here is that, you know, so if the teacher, if the TRA funds and the St. Paul Teachers Retirement Fund um, are technically they're underfunded. Um, they're you know below the the funding level that would provide for all the benefits that that they've already promised to um, the participants in the plan. And so, they're either investments with from, from those those pools would have to improve significantly, or there will need to be an increase in funding from the sources that fund them. Well, when you consider the pathway of the funding, the funding goes from the state to the districts, and then we have an employee and an employer contribution, but it really all eventually comes, largely comes just from the state. So it would be convenient if they could pat, if they could figure out how to do that directly without having it to flow into our hands and passing it off to something else. But it's mo most critical to me that it would happen without <clears throat> impacting the expected changes that happen over time to general fund increases. Um, if it carves into that, then we'd be, pay, you know, would be playing catch up with today's students for promises that were made years ago, <coughs> and not funded properly by a whole list of predecessors. So, I, I don't know if it rises to anyone else's uh, top three concerns, and I respect that. <laughs> yeah. But it's 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 yeah. the sort of thing I, I read about at work sometimes. And yeah. well, it's it's very to me it's very much like the special ed cross subsidy in that mm -hmm. this is a um, this is a big a big item to chew to chew off. Um, um, agreed that it's an yeah. important one because it it's that, that that's a very long term item. Yeah. And it was discussed last year. There were there were there was suggestion that there were going to be um, funds for it, and at the time it was suggested that it would come at the expense of an increase in the general fund or would somehow carve into the planned planned increase in the general fund, and that that would affect us, I think, in a way that we didn't want. Right. So. I think the, the main thing that I'm thinking is everything that is listed in this document and that we've talked about is worthy and important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think really focusing in on the couple of things that we really want to prioritize um, feels critical. Like I, I think this AMSD draft is good, but it feels like too much. Mm -hmm. um, particularly in light of the fact that this is not a budget year at the legislature and um, at the at the legislator, you know, uh, school board member gathering that I went to a month or two ago, the legislators were pretty clear there's likely not going to be money flowing this next legislative session. So I think making sure we do have some non-financial things that we're asking for, like the ACT, um, SAT option, I think makes a lot of sense so that we can hopefully see some success this session, even if it's not going to have dollars attached to it. Agreed That's a good point. That, totally agree that uh, <coughs> strategically, and, and I, I'm also thinking about um, our particular local audience. Mm -hmm. um, 
when we're thinking of one of the one of the positions that we sometimes find ourselves in is um, sort of preaching to the choir with our local legislators who are right. fully on board with all of the uh, initiatives we may be um, advocating for, and yet um, their ability to move an agenda forward, especially if they're in the minority party, um, is somewhat challenged at the legislature. Um, after some of these policy items, you may, may be able to find a, a broader consensus. Yeah. And we partner our platform with the AMSD platform and have a clear three or four items that we work on. It allows me as the superintendent and you all as board members to go advocate at the legislature. Um, and then we also partner with AMSD districts and they also work often with MSBA, the school boards association, and the school administrators with a common push in that same direction. So it does spread beyond just our area. Um, any other thoughts? So I'm hearing special ed cross subsidy, teacher diversity, and then I'm definitely hearing a conversation about ACT MC or MCA switch um, in terms of sort of our top three. Um, if there's nothing further, I can bring those back and we'll just sort of ratify that um, at our next meeting. Um, and if we have reflections in the meanwhile, we can have more conversation about that. I think we should also consider Matthew here as a potential testifier at the legislature. <laughs> yeah, you're very compelling. <laughs> I think when the time comes, I think I think that's absolutely an opportunity, and I think Matthew would do very well. All right, so with that, I'm going to move on to a ties update. So superintendents um, met with ties, and we've had ties board meetings with Mr. Patternis. Um, Ms. Bracky has been um, visiting ties, and so ties currently is struggling a little bit. Just for background, TIES is a technology-based consortium um, that is a consortium of about 48 districts. Um, at present, 12 of those districts um, wrote a letter uh, suggesting that they may leave at the end of this particular calendar year. Um, TIES has also asked for some additional funds to help meet their overall payroll. Um, and so TIES, from a financial perspective, has been deficit spending for a set of years and is now at a place where they are struggling to remain afloat. Um, conversation at the superintendent level, um, and we didn't take any action, but something to reflect on, um, and that our board members and Mr. Patternis will be able to continue to have voice longer term is whether or not TIES actually dissolves in the larger picture. Um, something that could happen in 18 months, 24 months, or actually not at all. Um, and so as we watch, um, and we participate in the conversation of our consortium at TIES and we think about collaboratives overall. Um, it's important to note that we utilize TIES for software, for some support and for technology. And over the past couple of years, we have been working um, very diligently to make sure that all the platforms that we use and that we add or that we change are things that can stand alone with or without TIES in the larger picture. Because we have been aware and we've had conversation at this level about the deficit spending of TIES and some of the concerns we might have about their long-term viability. Uh, one of the ways we can protect ourselves um, in the larger picture, and we may or may not use this, um, would be to think about a letter to possibly withdraw from ties. Um, and so the bylaws of ties basically say that by February of the preceding school year, so if we were to by February of this coming year, uh, put in a letter saying we were planning to withdraw from ties, we would be able to actually do that by June 30th, 2019. Um, how that protects us is it gives us an opportunity to remain within ties or retract that letter. Um, it also gives us an opportunity to pull out from ties, um, really depending because of the instability, we really don't know where things are going to land at this point. Um, with disillusion on the possible horizon, um, taking the steps to protect and support Richfield in our long-term financial and technological viability, um, these are important steps to take to make sure that we are looking out for the best interests of our constituents. Um, again, there will be ongoing conversations, including our Director of Technology, including Board Member Bracky, the representative to TIES, and also myself in ongoing superintendent conversations, and I'll continue to provide updates. Um, my overall plan is to gather feedback today, um, and then most likely bring back this particular letter as a business agenda item. Um, and again, you are able to withdraw and not utilize that letter. However, you cannot withdraw if you do not put in a letter of, of this type. Um, so with that, I'm gonna open things up for questions. I would just share the note too that the TIES annual meeting is this week and so Anthony, superintendent and myself will all be present for that where I suspect we will get additional information from the TIES executive committee and also get a sense from all of the member districts that will be present about how people are feeling and thinking about this pretty critical moment in time. 
So uh, you did mention that you've been working uh, for several years to uh, make sure that from a technology perspective that we have platforms that can function independently should that need arise. Do we have a vulnerability still where we are potentially <coughs> dependent? Um, we do at present. So first it would be important to note that if ties were to dissolve, um, the conversation that we've been having is they would be committed to supporting over the next 18 months to 24 months as districts disentangle themselves from the things that connect to ties. Uh, some of the transformations we have done within our HR and finance system, within our synergy and our student database systems, those are separate from ties platforms and can be supported in or outside of ties. Um, there are a couple of products that we do use. Um, they're solely ties based products. Uh, some of the things that would connect to whether or not those remain viable is if ties were to dissolve, one assumes that they would be selling off their assets. So right now ties owns a very nice building um, on the corner of Snelling and University. Ties also owns some software that could be viable for other technology based companies. And so over the next 18 to 24 months, um, as we watch ties, we'll be We'll be watching whether or not um, they are selling some of those softwares and partnering up with that. And we'll also continue to investigate, um, and I think there are three software items. It's, I'm gonna look to Mr. Patternus from a little bit of assistance. So we've got two really that are left that were ties created. One is ePay, um, which uh, there are probably some high viable contenders that would potentially buy that one out. Um, and the other one is iContent, which is our document um, curating tool mostly use um, in finance department, um, but our key critical systems with e-finance and Synergy, as Steve alluded to, um, are independent of ties, and if ties were to dissolve, uh, we could move those databases or contract directly with power schools or, or um, edging point for continuation of those services. Is there a particular reason ties is having these financial issues? Um, so they have some fiscally viable products and they have some fiscally non-viable products. Um, and as part of their past, they really haven't um, eliminated non-viable products. Um, and so they have had areas where they are significantly deficit spending. Um, and so they're trying to move themselves that direction. But over the last couple of years, they've cut from about 150 staff down to about 75 staff. Um, they also, um, they struggle with contracts. One of the assumptions that's historically been a ties assumption is, is with 48 districts, all 48 of us will use services in all of their areas. So if you think about what we've already done, we get internet from an from a area other than ties um, because it is less expensive for us to utilize our current vendor than it is to utilize ties as a vendor for internet technology. Now, they signed a contract anyways, assuming that we will buy their product. And so now they, Ties is on the hook for a product that we are not using, and that happens across multiple products across multiple districts, and they probably need to do a more effective job at analyzing the market and analyzing the collaboratives. Um, because as we've seen with other collaboratives, WeMap um, and obviously Ties and some of the others we've examined, um, collaboratives have had a sense in the market at one point where it was extremely valuable for many districts to be part of, and you could save significant amounts of money and really do things you couldn't. Um, but now with technology and access like we have nowadays, um, there's a lot of challenges going on in a lot of the collaboratives and a lot of collaboratives are under significant stress at these times. I would just add to, um, there, uh, there were some audits done, what was it, six, seven years ago now that just showed sort of a pattern of management um, concerns that I think have contributed to the current financial challenges. Um, and so if you Google ties and Star Tribune, there's probably any number of stories you can read about uh, some of the factors that I think have contributed to where it is today. <coughs> Do, what, is, what is there within the partnership there? There obviously are, they, we've granted the power of assessing us something, correct? Or it's within, it's within the membership, correct? They, 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 they have the opportunity to come to us and say, we want money from you based on some, some um, metric? Yes and no. Yes and yes. no. Okay. There is an agreed upon fees and there is a process by the joint powers agreement to assess additional fees um, if the board approves of that. If the board approved it, okay. Is there, are there limits on that and are how frequently they could do it? Um, there is not. However, the board of directors involves all voting members and up to, I think, two voting members from every single district. Um, and so all of the 48 districts would have to vote yes for it to be a binding agreement for additional fees. 
Um, at present, they asked for $7 additional per student from all of their districts. Um, their concern was actually having enough fiscal viability to meet payroll for the last three months of their school year, um, which could obviously, as we interact with them in our uh, payroll system and they, they partner with our student information system, um, their ability to staff their building at this time um, is pretty significant to us, um, obviously over the short term. But obviously we don't want them coming back to us repeatedly saying we need more money to function. So, so for that assessment to go through, we would have to vote for it. Is that what you? Is that what you said? Um, you said the forty-eight. The board of, no, the board of directors of ties. The board of directors of ties. Um, to make it mandatory. By, by we, our representatives on that board, though, or is um, board? would either have to vote for it, or we would have to voluntarily fund that that money. Which um, is what they're currently at. The executive committee of ties has has put out the the request okay. that member districts provide that additional funding. Um, so that is that has already happened. Okay. So we have yet to pay that fee. Um, we have been right. reflecting on that request at this time to determine um, our needs, what's fiscally responsible for us as an organization, um, and, and what best to do with that. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so we'll bring back ties um, in a week. And we'll move on to commendations. All right, so uh, two commendations. I'm gonna actually flip them around. I'm gonna give a quick commendation. Congratulations to Craig Holgey. Uh, Craig Holgey was appointed to the Board of Directors for the Richfield Chamber of Commerce, um, effective January 1st, 2018. So he is now a board member or will be of the Richfield Chamber of Commerce. Congratulations, Mr. Holgey. Um, and then uh, commendation, special thanks and appreciation to our school referendum teams, especially the Richfield Citizens for a Quality Community known as the CQC. Uh, thanks to all volunteers, parents, current and former staff, and community residents who gave their time, talents to get our bill or to build public awareness for the referendum. The uh, amount of hard work by our community in creating their campaign um, and the amount of support from the community was extraordinary. Uh, we're honored as a school district to uh, be given the trust and continued support of our community um, that believes obviously in strong schools for all of our children. And just as a reminder, um, bulk referendum passed, operational and capital at over 75% approval. So something that as a district, uh, we can be very proud of the level of partnership we have with our community and the level of support that the community shows for this organization. Okay, I, I, I have to second that. It was, it's, it's really a humbling experience almost to see the uh, level of energy um, that was marshaled uh, behind this uh, effort on behalf of our students. So I'm very proud of our community uh, for stepping up and, and investing in our future. I think it's a proud moment. I would say the CQC group was a really strong group of varied parents, community members, um, teachers. It was just an, a really strong group of committed people that all worked together. Um, no one person or small group could have done that. Everybody did you know, a significant part and put in, have put in a lot of time since last April they've been working on it so and they have it was very coordinated organized and well done okay so we will move on to the consent agenda if anyone is prepared to move the consent agenda I'll move the consent agenda I'll say Go ahead. I'll, I'll have a second. We have a motion by Ms. Brown, <laughs> second by Ms. Cole. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye and the consent agenda is approved. So we will, we will move on to board policy review in old business and policy two, 203 organization of the Board of Education. All right, so this is a policy um, that we've actually already approved, but we caught a slight um, numbering situation in terms of some of the numbering reference in there. Um, the model policy for public comment um, from MSBA is actually 206. Um, however, we have a different policy that utilizes 206, so we don't want that cross-reference to be incorrect. Um, so going throughout, um, the only changes going to this policy would actually be changing 206 to 216, which would be our public comment policy, and then the guidelines that we're gonna begin conversation on um, right after this. So for that technical change, uh, I think we're good to go. I will move that we uh, approve the policy as amended. Second. So we have a motion by Mr. Tensing, a second by Mr. Ashmead. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes and policy 203 is approved. 
So we will move on to 216.1 and 216.2 guidelines for and the form for public comment. All right, so as we think about, um, we've put in 216 for reference, um, followed up um, by um, guideline 216.1 uh, based on the feedback we've had from this group. And then also the form we would be utilizing for public comment, 216.2. Um, this won't be passed today. This is to show in front of you and get some feedback uh, prior to moving this forward. Um, and so when we do um, actually move forward guidelines 216.1, some of the details that are in here that will be published uh, won't necessarily be in the guideline or be in the publication. For example, um, we have responsibility for public comments, citing that the school district administration is responsible for the procedural implementation. Um, we're talking about the preparation for public comment, which would typically happen on the third Monday of the month or the second meeting of the month. Um, and in months with only one meeting, that meeting shall include public comment. Um, and so it's every second meeting, and then also if there's one meeting, it would be in there. Uh, sign up, well, we have put in the board secretary and put in Beth Picard's email and phone number. We'll actually take that out because that won't be part of our guideline, but that will be what we share publicly uh, to be making sure that the entire public is aware of where we make that contact. Um, and then similarly, um, just overall, what public comment will happen in order, um, and then how communication goes during public comment and also about public comment. Um, from there, you see 216.2, which is the form that we have been utilizing um, to connect to public comment. And then if there are those who are here for public comment that um, we are not having at this particular meeting, we have an opportunity for them to write down comments and share those with the board. Um, and so are there thoughts or feedback on guidelines or form at this time? I found one, uh, which is perhaps just a typo. This would be in 216.1, section 5, which is uh, communication during public comment, where we're sort of giving some guidance on the um, uh, sort <laughs> of should not. Correct, should there's not. a not in there. That's right. Speakers yes, should I'm not right. include names of RPS employees, titles, or location names. Yeah. Right. That's all I found. That was a big one. Yeah. <laughs> I do have one. Sorry. Yes. That's a big word. Yes. Keep going. Um, I am. I personally am troubled, concerned by the 6:45 p.m. cutoff time for the uh, for the the evening of the meeting, just because that feels um, to me not not knowing context for why 6:45 was picked. It feels a little bit arbitrary. Um, <laughs> you know i often don't get here until after 6 45 pm and so thinking that you know we would expect members of the public to know to be here by 6 45 pm if they wanted to sign up especially since that is inconsistent with other public bodies in our city where people can come up until the beginning of the meeting and and choose to make public comment just uh it's, I think at this moment, it's hard for me to explain that rationale and know why that particular decision would be made. Are you suggesting a seven o'clock? I, I know when we when we were talking about this policy being passed, it was up until the you know when the meeting mm -hmm. began. So essentially, sure. you know, six fifty nine p.m. Um, is when that sign up sheet would be pulled and in the chair's hand. Okay. Did you make that change? That sounds reasonable to me. I can live with that. It's 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And and again, if there was a if there is a reason behind it, I'm open to hearing it. It was just surprising to I me. Mean, my, my perception was just the, the ability to prepare for that. So for yeah. for Beth to get that information to me, and so I would have the names and would be able to do that in advance. Plus, I I like to introduce myself to the people that are speaking before, which is kind of nice. But I don't. I could do that to the people that arrive with the yeah. people that arrive at six forty-five, and mm -hmm. just where, go with it. Where will six fifty-nine leave the part of the policy where is reviewed for making sure that there's no privacy concerns? And I think you, I think Beth will have something to give to them when they show up for them to read with the guidelines of what No, but I mean, is, what if the content's already, like, we don't know, like, I just... Well, why don't... You never I mean, do. I don't mind, yeah, like, I'm true. of the... I mean, <laughs> you don't. I'm of the opinion, yeah. you know, I don't mind anybody, you know, just come and tell me what you yeah. want, but I know that we talked a lot for weeks, you know, during mm -hmm. meetings about all the privacy concerns that we had about employee, mm -hmm. and then... Um, 
what, where we are now with reviewing like the the content of the comments and how does that match up with what we talked about i mean so we're actually in a place where we no longer review the statements so we okay. are as you read the new policy and the new guidelines we are not reviewing statements we are being very clear about the guidelines and the expectations um and then so we we're, we're doing what we said in the last meeting then that we will leave it to the chair to in the moment to say this is that out of order if it's out, out of order, order. Yeah. okay Correct. all right i think i mean one thing that that does is not knowing the content in advance is it takes away a perception of you know Big a bias one yeah. way or the other i think it just it's not possible yeah. to have that if yeah. we don't know what is involved and everyone is allowed to speak So what we did at the request of the board was we evaluated our neighboring districts and their policies and then our community governing bodies and their policies. There are the, there are groups that actually take it up to any point, including signing up at the time. There are groups that have sign up stopping in advance and there are groups that have sign up stopping at the start of meetings. There aren't groups that reevaluate or evaluate each of the statements prior in advance. Um, most of them have what we have now put in, which is um, name, address, phone number, um, and the subject they're addressing and if it's a specific agenda item that also um, i'm in agreement in. with that i yeah, i yeah. i think the, the less choice we have about who talks the better i mm -hmm. i mm -hmm. think you know the more open the better uh, i just there was this part of me that but then when you said about calling to order and having then mm -hmm. it, brought me back to, it was a long time ago since we met last you know? <laughs> <laughs> So any other feedback on guideline or form? Um, I have a couple much smaller things, so I will okay. email them to, to you and to Beth so you can take them under consideration. Perfect. Um, one other thing that I have heard said before is to not include necessarily a name in a policy. I know this is a guideline, but do we? Right, no, we'll be taking that out. So that okay. is for you all to know that when we publish it, because one of the expectations um, of this policy that administration will be broadly communicating. Um, and so board secretary doesn't clarify for people. So when we broadly communicate, um, Beth will have her email and phone number on there, but within our okay. policy guideline, when I bring it back next month or next week, <laughs> um, yeah, next week, next week. Next week um, it actually won't be in there. Okay. Um, and so, but to note for you all that that informationally, that will be how we communicate that out broadly. All right. Okay, so we will move on to new business and canvassing, canvassing returns of votes of school district general and special education. Special That's election. Not, special election. Yes. Bad typing. All right, so this is the point um, where we review the election results. Looks like, Mr. Holger, are you supporting this one or are you coming after that? You just Got it. Me to be available. Got it, yes. So Mr. Holger <laughs> is available for comments. Um, and so as we um, work our way through, um, our role is to review and canvas the information from the election. Um, there will be a resolution canvassing the returns of votes, um, both on the general and the special election. Um, and so just as a reminder, you will be resolving um, that we did hold an election. Um, we did it appropriately and legally. Uh, 5,036 voters voted, electing three school board members. Um, in order, the top three, Christine Mallett, 2585 votes, Peter Tensing, 2425 votes, and Timothy Paulus, 2373 votes. Um, so each of those three, Christine Mallett, Peter Tensing, and Timothy Paulus, um, received the highest number of votes and would be elected to four-year terms beginning the first Monday in January 2018. Um, also, that we had a special election occurring on that same date that was done appropriately and legally, um, of which um, School District Question 1, 3,756 people voted in favor, 1,250 voted this, um, against it, um, with 30 um, either blank or defective ballots not voting on Question 1. Uh, question 2, um, Capital. Um, we had 3,776 voting in favor, 1,235 against, and 25 blank or defective ballots. Um, and so then um, you would be certifying the clerk um, or directing the clerk to certify the results of the election. Um, and so now it is your responsibility um, to push forth the resolution um, to move those results to canvass the election. I will move the resolution as presented. I will second. 
Okay, we have a motion by Ms. Brocky, a second by Mr. Ashmead. Um, is there any further discussion? This is a resolution, so I will pull the board. Ms. Cole? Aye. Mr. Densing? Aye. Mr. Ashmead? Aye. Ms. Brocky? Aye. Mr. Paulus? Aye. And the chair votes aye, so the resolution passes. And Second component of the same type of, in, okay. of business. Um, another resolution, issuance of certificates of election and directing the school district clerk to perform other election related duties. Um, and so basically this resolution allows us to um, issue certificates that um, certify the election and basically put um, Ms. Malik, Mr. Tensing and Mr. Paulus um, back into new four year school board terms. Um, and then also one of the joys of the school district clerk, Mrs. Picard's job, um, is to do a set of election required responsibilities. She um, ends up publishing and packaging affidavits that each of these things occurred. Um, similarly, so she will um, create an affidavit of the resolutions that we're doing today. Um, and so the other resolution that we'll be doing um, allows her to um, take those actions on behalf of the school board and, and make all of those things official and create appropriate as mandated files. <coughs> I will move the resolution as presented. I Okay, we have a motion by Ms. Brocky, a second by Ms. Cole. Is there any further discussion? Again, this is a resolution, so I will pull the board. Ms. Cole? Aye. Mr. Tensing? Aye. Mr. Ashman? Aye. Ms. Brocky? Aye. Mr. Paulus? Aye. The chair votes aye, so the resolution passes. And we move. And so just as oh, a quick ahead. reminder, while well, we have them in the board packet, um, but we aren't doing those, you'll notice the acceptance of office and oath of office, um, which each of our three re-elected board members will take in January. So at our January meeting, um, this is the foreshadowing of what will happen then, you'll each be expected to then accept that opportunity um, and take the oath of office to continue moving forward as school board members. And that happens at our first meeting in January. Okay, thank you. So we will move on to the annual statement of assurance and Mr. Holgey. Thank you. Um, this is something that comes to the board every year. We have a requirement to submit this prior or to the Department of Education prior to November 15th. It basically ensures that we've reviewed all of our um, policies, procedures, regulations to make sure that we are complying with state and federal laws associated with that. Um, we do this every year. If there are changes in policies during the term of that year, we submit those changes um, and um, file this online with the Department of Education. I will move the item as presented. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Paulus, a second by Ms. Brocky. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye, and the annual statement of assurance passes. We will no now move on to resolution of intent to issue general obligation bonds. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Olson referenced these earlier during the presentation on the bond and, ref uh, the bond and LTFM projects. Um, we are obligated to submit a notice of intent um, to, the, uh, to the official newspaper as well as have board action authorizing that um, resolution of intent to issue general obligation bonds. This is for the $32,430,000 in bonds that were previously presented to the board through the long-term facilities maintenance 10-year plan, um, have been submitted to the Department of Education as part of that, and those are the bonds that fall within the board's authority because they address indoor air quality issues. Um, there's a resolution here that's been provided by our attorney, Tom Deans, um, to help support that work here this evening. And so we are requesting this so that we can have that meet the timeline for the 20 days prior to the um, levy certification taking place on December 18. I will move this resolution. I'll second. So we have a motion by Mr. Tensing, a second by Mr. Paulus. Any further discussion? Again, this is another resolution, so I will pull the board. Ms. Cole? Aye. Mr. Tenson? Aye. Mr. Ashman? Aye. Ms. Brocky? Aye. Mr. Paulus? Aye. The chair votes aye, and the resolution passes. So we will move on to another resolution, establishing procedures for reimbursement from future bond issues. Thank you. Um, this essentially, as Mr. Olson talked about previously, authorizes us, us to access the bonds either issued through this long-term facilities maintenance or through the um, voter-approved bond referendum. 
um, prior to the actual issuance of those for the planning and preparation that's associated with those or any of the anticipated expenditures. Uh, this is something that the board back in, I think it was 2014 or 2015, had completed as part of the technology referendum, but we're bringing it here um, because we have a large bond issue and to make sure that the board is fully authorizing this as part of that process. It establishes those procedures that have been developed by Tom Deans and recommended for us to be administering. And then there is a final item in here that is the attachment that we would be using to submit for those reimbursements at that time. I will move the resolution. I'll second the motion. So we have a motion by Ms. Brocky, a second by Mr. Tensing. Again, this is a resolution, so I'll pull the board. I'm starting on this side. This <laughs> Mr. Pollock. Aye. Ms. Brocky. Aye. Mr. Ashmead. Aye. Mr. Tensing. Aye. Ms. Cole. Aye. The chair votes aye and the resolution passes. So we will now move on to partial re-roofing project for Richfield Senior High. Thank you. Um, this also is a project that was purported in the long-term facilities maintenance plan. Um, it is for partial re-roofing of a couple of areas at the high school. Um, we have looked at this as far as how that fits in with our bigger projects. Um, worked with ICS to make sure that that is aligned well with those projects and that it won't be interfering with construction or it won't be redundant with construction that would be taking place. Um, we identified these areas with INSPEC's help. Um, annually they do a review of our roofs. Um, what are the areas, what are the status of those roofs and identify those that are in highest priority. Um, as we've talked about in the past, we haven't been able to hit all of our highest priority areas on every area within our long-term facilities maintenance, um, but these appear to be the areas that um, are best aligned with that work in that high priority needs areas as far as the um, current state of those roofs um, as well as um, won't be impacted by any other construction and won't be any in any areas that we would be changing those physical structures of those roofs so that would require us to redo that in the future. So um, have been communicating all along with ICS. They've been helping support that long-term facilities maintenance planning um, as well as the work with INSPEC and some of our other engineering partners that we have in the district. So with that, we ask for your authorization to move this forward. This is specifically engaging the professional services associated with it. Um, once those are set up, and you can see those professional services come to about 34,000 for the design work and 14,000 for the construction observation and testing. Um, later on um, in this school year, we will come and ask for the authorization to seek bids for that and then actually awarding the bids. Um, for the construction part of the project, but we need to complete this design work before we get to that stage of actually seeking bids. So, sorry, I was going to ask a question. One of the one of the uh, sections of the building that is that appears to be covered is the uh, uh, what used to be sort of the industrial arts wing. Yep. Um, and and, it, and this may be me not remembering exactly what we had scoped in with our. Um, uh, facilities work. I know that that was one area where it, we felt that there was maybe some opportunity. Um, but what I hear you saying is that any opportunity that we would have to do redesign within that part of the high school would not be affecting the roof line. Correct. Yeah. Just want to clarify. And I was going to say thank you for the broader context and how this fits yep. into the very large work that is ahead of us. Yep. It's very helpful. Yep. I think, and obviously, you know, a lot of times we brought these things forward after we've gone through the design process, but we just want to be clear that we are very being very um, intentional on what projects we are taking on in the immediate short term. You heard Pat talk about, you know, next summer will be those most urgent needs that aren't going to be impacted by other parts of that work. Um, so that as we build out the larger construction projects that it's all aligned. We don't want to be redundant. We don't want to be wasting money. Um, we continue to make sure that we are being responsible for, with um, the funds that our taxpayers have granted us with and those that we have authority to to make sure that we are using those in the best ways possible. I also appreciate that we aren't putting off something that is should be scheduled and should be done that's maintenance. So we yep. do it on both sides. I will uh, move that. Uh, I'll jump you in here. I will move that we approve the uh, uh, partial re roofing project for Richfield High School. I will second. We have a motion by Mr. Hansing, a second by Mr. Ashmi. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye, and the partial re roofing project is approved.
And we will move on to donations. Thank you. Okay, so two donations. Uh, for several years, Peter Tozer has donated school supplies to the English Learners Department, so his kindness is greatly appreciated. So thank you, sir. Um, and then Centennial Elementary has received a generous donation of school supplies from the Lutheran Women's Missionary League of Messiah Lutheran Church in Lakeville. Uh, the League will also donate 100% of collections from their December 3rd Advent service and event to Centennial to purchase books for the Media Center and to purchase warm winter clothing for students and families in need. So we thank um, the Messiah Lutheran Church in Lakeville also. That's, uh, there, there, there may be a backstory on, on that donation. Maybe something to hear about offline. Yeah, I don't know. It's great. I'm just very generous. You're very generous. Very generous. Very generous. Yeah. Okay, so we will. Oh, I'll move that we accept the donations that. with gratitude. I'll second that. We have a motion by Mr. Paulus, a second by Mr. Ashmead. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye, and we accept those donations with gratitude. So we will move on to advanced planning and the legislative update. Um, so we already did most of that, and so we'll bring back platform conversation uh, next week. Also note that um, we have had that request for study session with the city council, so we'll look to schedule one of those in December. Um, and then we'll also be looking for a study session with our legislators, um, and we'll probably be looking to that uh, late January or in February. Um, so just an update on possible dates coming in our future for study sessions. One thing that I did want to, are we in the information and questions section yet? I'm sorry, have I jumped in the gun? We can now move on to information and questions from the board. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. Thank you for bailing me out on that. Um, one thing that I did want to mention to board members is that the, um, I think you can see I'm referencing the email here, the AMSD annual conference um, will be on, I believe it's December 8th. Um, and uh, so registration is open for that. Uh, that is going to be a, a conference specifically on the reimagined Minnesota works. I just wanted to um, let board members know that that is going on and invite them to participate. Yes, so I've received inquiries from both um, Board Chair Malik and Vice Chair Brecky. Um, so with yourself, that actually totals three. Um, Almost quarter. We actually can't go beyond <laughs> that um, unless you all want to fight it out and have a conversation about who will go or who will represent. Um, and so I'm gonna leave that ball to you all um, for, for long-term representation. But we can have, they've invited up to three board members to really engage in that conversation and myself. Um, it won't be the uh, last time we obviously talk about Reimagine Minnesota because we're also doing Reimagine Richfield and doing some of that work here. Um, and so we're excited by that participation. I will be registering three board members um, and myself. And so we'll register four um, so that we're also paying the fees as a district um, to support the professional development and partnership of our board members. So uh, speaking of Reimagine Richfield, so uh, I, if I could get more information about that, I would like to be involved in this three board member process. Uh, I will be the week prior, uh, I will be a delegate to the assembly um, somehow I am signed up for two years for that um, but I look forward to it I did it last year uh, and it was great uh, really sh uh, real show of democracy and how this whole platform may will make sense uh, but back to reimagine Richfield I came here last Friday to attend the uh, Latino parent association meeting um, and I wanted to bring three things to for further discussion or maybe for some feedback reporting from uh, the district. The first one, uh, uh, Latanya was there from the high school and she was sharing a lot of how that is coming about and the point came that there are right now pair, um, staff and students involved in the, in the process of reimagining Richfield, but there's no parent involvement uh, either planned out or out there yet. So I'd like to make sure that that we do have those parent voices and that we try to really diversify the, that participation. The second thing that came about was that there's a concern about students coming from the dual language program and about meeting graduation requirements, even though this is really their sophomore year. But the perception from parents is that they're not going to be ready to graduate uh, high school. Uh, 
I commend them from thinking ahead. Uh, I did share with them, there's a lot of, uh, you know, we created a different programming so that everything meets the criteria with the state and all of that. But if we can make sure that all that information is more readily available and perhaps uh, explained. And then finally, along the same line, uh, some parents uh, were concerned that their students wanted to sign up for certain courses and were told that they couldn't. So uh, Latini and I did the best that we could to share, you know, this is because this program is special and it has these requirements and we have to comply and the timing and the scheduling doesn't really work sometimes for that. But if it comes really, uh, so maybe whenever uh, the high school is hosting our meeting, if, if we can, you know, talk about all of those things. Uh, so a couple pieces of follow-up. So in relation to Reimagine Richfield, yes, we're beginning with students and staff prior to expanding that um, to families. We actually have a Reimagine planning uh, meeting Thursday afternoon. Um, and then our first large group, so the first real large group engagement with students and staff is actually coming on the 29th at the end of this month. Um, and so we're gonna take it from there. Um, and one of the things is it's really about having the student voice brought forth and having them lead the agenda. Um, and so we're gonna continue to, well, we don't give exact answers where it's going. Um, we'll continue to move forward and continue to expand <laughs> voice um, and expand partnership with that. Um, and so definitely we'll make sure that there is wide ranging parent voice in that conversation also as we continue to move forward. Um, in terms of the expectations and requirements, um, we will continue to distribute that information and we'll continue to share. Um, dual language students actually have all of the ability and more to graduate and to graduate on time. Um, we have set things up so those are available and it is with the Spanish language arts and English language arts that um, allow that. But then also going to seven period day also takes care of that for the dual language students. And so as we have shared, but we'll continue to share, those concerns are actually unfounded. Um, but we'll, we'll do a much, um, much needed outreach to our families, um, again, to double down on that message that was given. Um, and then from a scheduling perspective, yes, one of the challenges that was presented um, by the high school, and they will be giving us an update in, I think, a couple months again um, about how things are going as they move towards the second semester. Um, some of the tightness of schedule as you think about um, classes and making sure all the classes fill is that as people have singletons or they have classes that are only offered once, the more of those a student has, the less likely they are to get every single class that they may want. And so as we continue to analyze areas where we can create better efficiencies and better effectiveness in the schedule, um, we'll absolutely continue to do that. Um, but yes, there were definitely, and I think that was presented, um, and I'll have Ms. Daniels come back with that, um, classes kids couldn't get into at times because they conflicted with other classes that were only one offering or two offerings at certain times of the day. And one more thing. <clears throat> yes. And it's not only about uh, Latino families. Uh, it came to uh, brought to the attention uh, a, a need, a request for more support f uh, learning about FAFSA and college applications mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the junior year because of by the time the meetings happen in the senior year by September you know the deadlines for colleges are happening in very short uh, period of time and mm -hmm. so I don't really know how we are doing it but how possible it is to to try to have those I know that there was that uh, there was a meeting that I believe was translated recently but that the families wanted to see that could be done the year prior. So I don't know what the... So that's in planning at the moment. Um, what um, Principal Daniels has talked about is moving from what's called a reactive counseling model or waiting for the students to come to you to a more proactive counseling model. And this is sort of the year of redefining what counseling will look like in Richfield Public Schools um, and then really moving in the next fall or as soon as we possibly can to a proactive model, which is more based on outreach, doing things in advance and really catching students earlier in the process. Um, to do a more effective job with counseling resources that we do have. Um, and so we're, we're definitely an area, you were pointing out absolute areas for growth and things that we will continue to look at to keep trying to improve. Yeah, because for all families, finding out about that information in, yes. in the junior year is, it, there are a lot of opportunities that the sooner you get out there and start looking and visiting right. colleges, the better. That's why I felt, and this is not just this group, no. but it was what it no. was yeah. for everybody. That I, I learned it last year <laughs> with the son that graduated last year, and my daughter's a junior now, and we're looking now. Everyone can benefit. And yeah. similarly with the scheduling issues, yes, they're certainly not 
just Latino families. That's that's across our entire system, and that's the same same thing that challenged um, across the entire high school. And things will continue to refine as we continue to improve our seven period day implementation. Well, I do think they did a good job because my daughter was wanted and to be in a class that she wasn't didn't get into, and we went in and met with the counselors before classes started, and they did a really good job of saying, yeah, you could take it this class, but here's what you would have to do. So you'd have to choose then if you really want this one, then you have to choose to not be in one of these band classes, which ended up staying with the schedule that they gave her. But I think having her be able see to see it, it yeah. yep. uh, really helps a lot, it, it, as opposed to just saying, you can't take yeah. this. Right. So. I mean, I think it just it definitely uh, just underscores, you know, Steve's commentary on um, we're in a transition process from uh, you know, moving from into a much more proactive model, um, but we are asking we are asking our staff to change the way they work, um, and so that that takes a little bit of time. Okay, so we will move on to future meeting dates. One week from today, we have our next meeting on November twentieth at seven p.m. A regular board meeting. And then our next meeting will be Monday, December 4th, which is also listed as, reg as a regular board meeting. Um, does anyone have any suggested future agenda items? And just as a reminder to preactively share, um, nutrition was expected to be in November, so that will be at our next meeting. There were also policies and guidelines, including field trip. Um, I think that's 926. Um, and then also, uh, actually that's 653. Um, and then 926 will also, the public relations communications will come back with some additional guidelines for those. Um, and so the policies that we had been working on, some of those will be returning back along with the ones that we worked on today. Because noting the large agenda we had today, we wanted to push some of those off till, till next week. And student discipline is still on the list likely for December. Correct. I would assume? Okay. Yes. Great. Um, in, with the discussion about Reimagine Richfield, I think it would be great. I don't know when the appropriate time would be, but for it to have some to have a report kind of come back to us with what's happening there, I'd like to. I'd be interested in hearing some student perspective. Absolutely, and it also is a time to think about as as Board Member Cole asked. Um, on the 29th will be the first day where it's where it's a large gathering of Reimagine Richfield, so you all might want to check on your calendar. So we do have that planning meeting later this week. Um, and I'll be able to provide an update to board members um, about that, the time, and, and what that might look like on the 29th. And so that'll be in the superintendent report. Um, and then we might be able to find opportunity for board members to participate. Great. So that is it. If anyone would like, would like to make a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> I will second the motion. For a minute there, I thought everyone wanted to stay. So we have a motion by Mr. Paulus, a second by Mr. Tensing. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The chair votes aye, and we are adjourned.